Buenas noches a todos. La Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes agradece la presencia de todos ustedes al, a, y les da la bienvenida al acto inaugural de la actividad científica del año 2022. Para comenzar, escucharemos las palabras de la señora presidenta de la sociedad, la doctora Silvia Gorbán de La Pertosa. Hola, hola, ¿se escucha ahí? Bueno, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos. Desde ya, muchísimas gracias por venir. Hoy es un día muy importante porque en cierta forma nos empezamos a encontrar, nos empezamos a juntar y para nosotros es muy importante porque más allá de la actividad científica, los lazos societarios, los lazos de amistad son las cosas que caracterizan a la Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes. Eh, en diciembre del año pasado se renovó la mitad de la comisión directiva y ahí en las fotos tienen los miembros que la componen actualmente, tanto a la comisión directiva, que tiene periodo hasta diciembre de este año, como a los revisores de cuentas titulares y suplentes y el, el honorable Consejo de Ética. Todo este equipo de trabajo día a día y durante todos los meses, está trabajando arduamente para poder llevar las distintas actividades que la sociedad se ha planteado. Inaugurar la, la reunión, las actividades científicas de la sociedad con el disertante, el doctor Ronald Kahn, en un año tan importante, el año pasado fue el descubrimiento de la insulina, pero en el 20, 20, en el, en, hace 100 años atrás, en el 22, se aplicó por primera vez la dosis de insulina. Y el año que viene se va a cumplir la primera aplicación de insulina en nuestro país. Es decir, que venimos realmente de celebración en celebración con un hito tan importante para la medicina en nuestro país. Las reuniones científicas planificadas para este año van a ser el 2 de mayo con todas las sociedades de diabetes de Latinoamérica, Uruguay, Chile, Paraguay, Bolivia, Perú, y el tema va a ser enfermedades poco frecuentes y diabetes, como lepra, leishmaniasis, COVID y Chagas, que es un tema que nunca abordamos. Eh, en junio va a ser una reunión conjunta entre la Sociedad y la Sociedad de Cardiología sobre insuficiencia cardíaca, en julio con la Sociedad Argentina de Osteoporosis, en agosto vamos a mm, traer a las reuniones científicas las nuevas estrategias de aprendizaje de simulación clínica con la Sociedad Argentina de Simulación Clínica y Seguridad del Paciente, el septiembre que hay de nuevo de diabetes y embarazo, dado que están las guías de determinación del punto de corte de diagnóstico que vamos a tener este año, y eh, en noviembre eh, una reunión conjunta con la Sociedad Argentina de Nutrición. No sé si esto por dónde pasa. O ahí. Sí, pero no pasa. ¿Se puede pasar la diapositiva? ¿Eh? ¿Cómo? Ahí está. Bien, eh, este año se ha renovado la dirección del Departamento de Educación e Investigación, que coordino junto con el doctor Frech y la doctora Feingold, en una comisión de educación que coordina la doctora Ferraro y la comisión de investigación que coordinan los doctores Rodríguez y Valeria Gil. Eh, el, la comisión de educación se reunió los días 29 y 30 de diciembre y fijó los roles, funciones y orientaciones generales de la orientación de formaciones que plantea la sociedad de acá en adelante, asimismo los honorarios docentes, el plan docente y el plan de capacitación que se va a realizar en todos los cursos y diplomaturas de la sociedad. Con respecto a los cursos, están pronto a iniciar el curso de capacitación para médicos de primer contacto con las personas con diabetes, por primera vez un curso avalado por la Facultad de Ciencias Exactas para los bioquímicos de todo el país, que es el laboratorio y la clínica en diabetes. Vamos a reiterar el curso de diabetes en la mujer, el curso de dietoterapia en personas con diabetes de la teoría a la práctica, y en pediatría una, un curso que va a empezar con complicaciones crónicas en diabetes tipo 1, en actualización en nutrición en el paciente adolescente con diabetes, y cerraríamos el año con curso de diabetes tipo 2 en el niño y adolescente. Eh, también va a haber el curso intensivo de conteos de hidratos de carbono ya en el segundo semestre, el curso por primera vez que vamos a editar de diabetes pregestacional, 
diabetes y enfermedad cardiovascular, abordaje en equipo, y vamos a reiterar por el gran éxito que tuvo el año pasado con la Sociedad Española de Endocrinología y Nutrición de España y la Universidad Emory con Guillermo Pierres, el manejo de la diabetes en el paciente hospitalizado. Todos estos cursos son online. También ya inicia este fin de semana el curso de tecnología en diabetes, que realmente fue un éxito con más de 200 inscriptos de toda Latinoamérica y de nuestro país, de todos los puntos del país, que obligó a hacer una selección por currículum y equipos de trabajo, dando que acceden a realizar el curso 96 eh, personas de los equipos de salud, porque no es solo para médicos, sino que es para los equipos de salud. Hemos realizado el taller de fundamentos de insulinoterapia aplicada al equipo de salud, con 580 participantes, realmente desbordó y superó las expectativas que teníamos. Esto se va a reiterar en forma gratuita en los meses de junio y octubre, y también se van a hacer dos talleres especiales para insulinización en el paciente oncológico y para insulinización en pediatría. Las diplomaturas que están en marcha son la Diplomatura Universitaria Superior en Diabetes y Obesidad, la de epidemiología de las enfermedades crónicas, la diplomatura superior en diabetes y factores de riesgo cardiovascular, la diplomatura universitaria para enfermería con orientación en educación y la diplomatura superior en educación terapéutica. Estas diplomaturas vienen a superar y a tener un nivel más de calidad de va a congeniar las experiencias docentes que teníamos en ir dándoles un marco universitario a las, a las propuestas académicas que tenemos. Por eso, lentamente, cada una de estas actividades se van cubriendo con apoyo universitario, en este caso de la Universidad Nacional del Nordeste, pero también se inicia con la Universidad Austral, la Diplomatura de Cirugía Metabólica, con la Universidad Nacional de La Pampa, la Diplomatura Superior en Manejo Integral del Pie Diabético, y con la Universidad Massa, la Diplomatura Universitaria dirigida a las licenciadas en nutrición. Es decir que no solo hacemos cursos universitarios, sino que también ampliamos el apoyo de distintas universidades. Con respecto a las capacitaciones docentes, el Departamento Pedagógico del DEI va a iniciar capacitación de nuestros docentes, tutores y directores de curso en instrumentos auxiliares de evaluación, en formación nueva de tutores y de directores y docentes, cuestiones de que cada uno de los cursos que realiza la sociedad y diplomaturas tienen que tener el aval de estar con formación docente para poder participar. Y hemos iniciado un curso universitario de actualización profesional en simulación clínica, que es una nueva estrategia que va a ser aplicada en los cursos y diplomaturas de la sociedad. Este proyecto que surgió el año pasado, el diabetón para propuestas de educativas, se presentaron cuatro grupos en distintos planes y fue adjudicado el primer premio al grupo integrado por el doctor Forlino, la doctora Gómez Martín, la doctora Alejandra Maldino, Laura Pomares y Javier Remón en una propuesta que se llama Diabe Móvil. Eso va a ser una experiencia piloto en este año, pero la propuesta de la sociedad es que desde la comisión de investigación, las otras tres propuestas también sean plasmadas a través de un subsidio de investigación para ser aplicado, porque son novedosos en lo que tiene que ver con estrategias educativas para las personas con diabetes. La Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes, en unión con otras universidades, como el CONICET el, de la Universidad de Buenos Aires, de la, el CENEXA de La Plata, la Universidad del Nordeste, han eh, obtenido eh, un subsidio PICTO 2021 de la interacción de COVID-19 y diabetes. Esta es la primera vez que la sociedad, en unión con otras universidades, accede a un subsidio de investigación de importancia dirigida por el doctor Gustavo Freche. Ahora nos vamos a adentrar en una actividad que es la más importante en el año, que es el Congreso Argentino de Diabetes, que tendrá el precongreso el 28 de septiembre para el equipo de salud y la comunidad, y será una actividad que va a compartir la Federación Argentina de Medicina General, la Federación Argentina de Graduados en Nutrición, la Federación Argentina de Estudiantes de Ciencia de la Salud Científica y la, el capítulo nordeste, con la participación de los comités de pie diabético, actividad física y el comité de enfermería. Van a realizarse los primeros Juegos Olímpicos intercapítulos de la SAD eh, y la Corre Caminata, nuestro vicepresidente está ahí mostrando la remera que va a ser la identidad de la sociedad de cada uno de nuestros maratonistas en todos los eventos deportivos que haya, que se denomina SAD Corre porque eh, predica, hay que predicar con el ejemplo, ya que lo usamos como una de las herramientas terapéuticas. El Congreso se va a realizar en el Centro Metropolitano eh, de Convenciones de Rosario, 
del 28 de septiembre al 1 de octubre, con modalidad presencial, eh, y va a tener la participación de nueve, nueve distinguidos disertantes eh, en forma virtual, salvo eh, el doctor Ricardo Cohen, que va a estar presente de Brasil, pero realmente disertantes de un nivel académico superior, muy importante su participación. Se va a dar por primera vez la conferencia y medalla Bernardo José a la trayectoria en docencia e investigación básica en diabetes, que va a ser del, para el doctor Juan José Gagliardino, y la conferencia clínica y medalla Pedro Escudero a la trayectoria en asistencia e investigación clínica en diabetes del profesor Jorge Alvariñas, y con esto se inaugura las conferencias con medallas para los distintos congresos de, nuestro, de nuestra sociedad. Se hace la convocatoria a los subsidios 2022, que cierra el primero de junio, dos subsidios en el área básica, dos en el área epidemiológica y tres en el área clínica, y el subsidio de investigación especial, cuyo tema para este año es tecnología aplicada a la diabetes, que puede ser en cualquiera de esas áreas. Por primera vez el Congreso va a tener la presentación de casos clínicos, se van a seleccionar 20 casos clínicos de interés, debe ser inédito, no haber sido publicado ni en forma nacional ni, ni, ni en ningún Congreso internacional, y la fecha límite de envío también es el primero de junio. Se instaura el premio Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes a los mejores trabajos básicos y clínicos. Y también ahí el trabajo de ese presente deben enviar el trabajo completo para acceder al premio. Los distintos comités de la sociedad han trabajado en recomendaciones que van a ser publicadas en la revista de la sociedad, año a año, a través de una pregunta pico o un tema de interés. Cada uno de los comités han trabajado en uno de ellos y ya están en la, en la editorial de la revista para su publicación. Como pueden ver, son 14 recomendaciones que ya están para la publicación y así eh, los comités empiezan a trabajar en otros temas de interés. También se van a presentar las nuevas guías y recomendaciones sobre edema macular diabético y retinopatía diabética eh, con las sociedades de retina y vitrio, la Sociedad Argentina de Oftalmología y la Sociedad, que serán presentadas en el ámbito del Congreso. Se, está, se ha constituido una comisión de trabajo para discutir las recomendaciones de laboratorio, para discutir los puntos de corte de prediabetes y glucemia en ayunas alterada y si se va a utilizar o no la hemoglobina glicosilada como diagnóstico. Es momento de actualizar nuestras recomendaciones dentro de la sociedad. Con respecto al Comité de Obesidad, la, el Comité de Obesidad tuvo la iniciativa de un documento conjunto con nueve sociedades médicas que generó un gran impacto en los medios de comunicación y también se celebró el Día Mundial de la Obesidad y hace muy poquito la doctora Wood fue invitada a participar en una mesa en la Universidad de Salud con presencia de las autoridades nacionales de la OPS para plantear la postura de las nueve sociedades científicas y las líneas de acción para combatir otra de las pandemias que azotan al siglo XXI. El Comité de Pediatría va a profundizar lo que es el trabajo del proyecto KIDS, que es la prevención de diabetes 2 a través de prevención de obesidad en las escuelas y la capacitación de maestros y niños con diabetes 1, que tuvo un éxito el año pasado con más de 10 eh, lugares, más de 10 escuelas que participaron y se va a extender a distintas localidades y provincias de nuestro país. En la Comisión de Comunicación está trabajando en la renovación de los nuevos podcasts que ya han salido, esta semana salió el tercero con el doctor Joaquín González, esas son las líneas de comunicación a través de Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, y también ha sacado la recomendación para las catástrofes cuando fueron los incendios en la provincia de Corrientes, que fue muy bien aceptado por todos los cuarteles de bomberos y los guardaparques haber recibido estas recomendaciones para las catástrofes. Con respecto a los oficios judiciales, tanto el Comité de Innovación como Farmacología, que es donde más llegan los oficios judiciales, está normatizando las respuestas a los oficios y por primera vez la asesoría legal está pidiendo la regulación de honorarios ante el dictamen que hace cada uno de los comités. Con respecto al Ministerio de Salud de la Nación, estamos trabajando en las guías de prácticas clínicas nacionales de obesidad, en la clínica control prenatal, en las de diagnóstico de diabetes gestacional y en las guías nacionales de manejo de la enfermedad renal crónica para el primer nivel de atención. También estamos trabajando con la Dirección Nacional de Abordaje Integral por Cursos de Vida para implementar capacitación de todos los equipos de atención primaria de la salud 
eh, en diabetes y embarazo y en las maternidades en las 24 provincias de nuestro país en una construcción conjunta con las direcciones de maternidad e infancia. Con respecto a la provincia de Buenos Aires, eh, muy cercanamente la semana que viene se inicia el curso para diabetes 2 para los médicos de 135 municipios que fue elaborado y construido con el comité de docencia de nuestra sociedad y la dirección del programa provincial de diabetes y también estamos trabajando con la obra social provincial en función del BADEMECUN y el acceso a la atención de acuerdo a las nuevas recomendaciones que pueda aportar la Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes. La red de prestadores de PRODIABA, que es el programa provincial, trabaja coordinado por el capítulo atlántico, aumentó en un 46% el padrón de, de personas con diabetes que acceden a la atención gratuita y a los medicamentos, y en el BADEMECUN, que fue asesorado por el Comité de Farmacología, por primera vez un programa provincial incorpora las CGLT2, los GLP1, la glicacida y normatiza el uso de lapiceras para los eh, pacientes con diabetes tipo 1 que estaban con uso de eh, frasco ampolla. También hemos participado en el foro del colesterol eh, con todas las sociedades de cardiología, la, el Ministerio de Salud de la Nación, la Organización Panamericana de la Salud, en función de fomentar capacitación de los equipos de salud, sacar recomendaciones y desarrollar un curso virtual para el primer nivel de atención. La mesa intersectorial que venía trabajando ya desde el año pasado ha logrado concretar con todas esas sociedades que ustedes ven en la diapositiva 10 eh, temas para tratar en simposios en las 46 facultades de medicina, en lo que es la práctica final obligatoria, que es el último año de medicina, a través de tomar el tema fundamental de prevención, diagnóstico precoz y conducta inicial. Esta actividad está coordinada por el doctor Martín Rodríguez, el doctor Gagliardino y el doctor Isaac Sinaí. Hay acciones en común que estamos planteando, tanto con la Federación de Graduados de Nutrición, la Sociedad Argentina de Cardiología, la Sociedad de Simulación y la Sociedad de, eh, de, 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 de Cirugía de la Obesidad, además de las otras sociedades que venimos trabajando, en la necesidad de no repetir cosas o duplicar esfuerzos cuando todos juntos podemos potenciar las actividades de formación académica y acciones que podamos hacer. También hemos planteado un programa de actividades con todas las sociedades latinoamericanas de diabetes, que la primera va a ser la reunión científica, va a haber una mesa de expertos en nuestro congreso, la participación tanto nuestra en los congresos de ellos como de ellos en nuestros congresos, y la, recomendación, la elaboración de recomendaciones comunes de interés entre las sociedades. También vamos, seguimos profundizando las actividades comunes con las asociaciones de personas con diabetes, sin usted presencia en la Federación Internacional de Diabetes, y estamos actualizando el reglamento de ética y con respecto a la especialidad, ya ha sido publicado en el boletín oficial la eh, categoría de calificación agregada en la cual estamos aportando toda la documentación para lograr, eh, eh, esperemos este año, obtener la especialidad en diabetes que tanto anhelamos. Así que muchas gracias a todos, a las secretarias de la sociedad por el apoyo incondicional a todas las actividades que hacemos y a la industria farmacéutica que nos permite desarrollar estas actividades. Muchas gracias. A continuación, presentamos a los integrantes de la Comisión Directiva Saliente del periodo 2020-2021. Los diplomas serán enviados. Continuando con la reunión, también presentamos a los miembros titulares que fueron aprobados por la Asamblea General Ordinaria del 13 de diciembre del 2021. Presentamos también a los miembros honorarios aprobados en la misma Asamblea, la doctora Glasten Liliana, o Termín María de los Ángeles y Simula Claudio. A continuación, invitamos a la subdirectora del curso de Educador Certificado en Diabetes, la doctora Alicia García, quien va a hacer entrega de los diplomas a los egresados de dicho curso del 2021. Doctora. Gracias. Bueno. Buenas noches a todos. La verdad que en mi carácter, como dijo recién, eh, de subdirectora y en representación de la doctora Yolena Larza, directora del curso, la licenciada Karina Antón y la doctora eh, 
Leticia Ferro, vamos y en nombre de todo el cuerpo docente vamos a hacer entrega de estos diplomas a los alumnos que terminaron el 12 curso de educación certificada de la sociedad de diabetes. Esta iniciativa comenzó, ah, dale, gracias. Esta iniciativa comenzó allá por el año 2010 con la doctora Ruiz, la doctora Eva López González y la doctora Estolarza, con el apoyo del doctor eh, o la iniciativa del doctor Gustavo Frestel y se fueron desarrollando múltiples cursos en forma anual que fueron generando esta eh, mística del curso de educadores que año tras año se fue superando con una concepción integradora del equipo multidisciplinario donde trabajan en conjunto, basado en el humanismo profesional, donde el eh, eje fundamental es la persona con diabetes, tanto en su concepción corporal, mental como eh, eh, emocional, por supuesto adaptado a su contexto eh, sociocultural. Eh, la pandemia... No, para... Este, bueno, empezamos de vuelta. Estos son los egresados de la promoción 2021. Como les comentaba, esto comenzó hace dos desde el 2010, con un curso presencial, netamente presencial, con múltiples actividades este, donde realizaban talleres y realmente una interacción muy nutricia entre los participantes. Esto, eh, lamentablemente, en, en el 2020, la pandemia determinó que tanto el cuerpo docente como la conducción y la secretaría de la sociedad tuviera que adaptarse a generar una forma virtual del curso, lo cual determinó que con mucho esfuerzo, muchas horas realmente, eh, se, pudo, eh, se logró adaptar el curso y se le pudo dar continuidad. Así, esta es la promoción del 2020 20, y esta última es la del que vamos a este, nominar ahora. En este sentido, la educación terapéutica realmente es una herramienta tan potente que en la nueva reglamentación que está por salir, y esperemos no sea pronto, en el anexo eh, segundo se ha incorporado dentro del PMO la eh, educación terapéutica. Esto en, en este anexo justamente se hace referencia a la importancia de eh, la educación terapéutica, a quiénes se tiene que dar, cuál es el formato o la modalidad y fundamentalmente que tiene que tener programas estructurados, es decir, tiene que tener una dirección clara de cuáles son los objetivos, las metas, para que se pueda evaluar sus resultados. Y también los momentos y la duración. Así tiene para todos aquellos que inician con diabetes 10 horas iniciales el primer año y luego refuerzos anuales de 2 horas eh, cátedra de eh, educación. También, por supuesto, horas disponibles para las situaciones especiales que ameriten la educación. ¿Cuál es el perfil del educador? Todos los profesionales que estén como dice aquí, asistan a personas con diabetes en su práctica clínica cotidiana y cuenten con una capacitación específica en diabetes. También los médicos especialistas en endocrinología y en nutrición y también los médicos especialistas en clínica médica, en medicina general y o familiar y pediatría que acrediten capacitación en entidades universitarias o en asociaciones eh, científicas afines a la diabetes. Entonces, el 12 curso de educador certificado, que es una formación, como les decía, eh, interdisciplinaria, lamentablemente los alumnos que este año eh, este, terminan conforman un universo de toda Latinoamérica. Tenemos eh, 
participantes de Perú, de Paraguay, de Uruguay este, y del país de múltiples provincias, lo cual hizo que fuera muy difícil para ellos asistir a este encuentro. Entonces, realmente contamos con una licenciada en psicología, nueve eh, licenciadas en enfermería, 14 licenciadas en nutrición y 15 médicos. Y esto con mucho agrado lo vemos, año a año cada vez más médicos se incorporan a los cursos de educación, dado que en nuestra formación tenemos mucho esto de transmitir conocimiento, pero el poder capacitarnos como educadores nos integra realmente como verdaderos educadores en los equipos multidisciplinarios. Por eso convoco a todos los egresados y a todos los que les gusta la educación que realmente conformemos equipos multidisciplinarios para poder dar este, actividades educativas de calidad, evaluadas y que publiquemos los resultados para que esta inclusión en el PMO tenga una validación en nuestra práctica asistencial y publicación. Entonces, ahora sí eh, vamos a hacer entrega a los dos representantes que han podido venir hasta aquí, que no sé si están presentes, pero bueno, la licenciada en enfermería Leticia Saucedo y este, la licenciada en nutrición Rocío Torrieri. Ellas dos este, habían comprometido su presentación. Ah, acá está. Pasa, pasa. Leticia Saucedo. Bueno. A continuación, haremos entrega de los diplomas a quienes realizaron la diplomatura superior en diabetes y sus complicaciones inicial y avanzada del año 2020. Invitamos a la doctora Carla Muso a hacer entrega de los mismos. Y... Pasan a recibirlo Altamirano Guerrero, Wendy Joana, Fiorentino Sabrina, Sánchez Agustina, Soler Riera María Cristina, Espada María Cristina, Justo Marina, García Julieta, Gamarra Inés. ¿Eh? No, no te escucho. Y Galindo Marcela, hacemos una foto todos juntos también. En la pantalla podemos ver a todos los otros egresados de la diplomatura, algunos de ellos no pudieron venir y se enviarán los diplomas correspondientes.
Bueno, un aplauso para todos. A continuación, haremos entrega a los egresados de la diplomatura inicial 2021 y avanzada 2021. Invitamos al doctor Alejandro de Dios a hacer entrega de los mismos. Almada Gabriela. Se prepara Carbajo Natalia. López Cecilia. Martínez Crespo Macarena. Oliva Yanina. Romano Claudia. Adjimán Karina. Los invitamos a todos a pasar al frente para hacer una foto conjunta. Y brindamos un aplauso para todos los que no pudieron venir, que también realizaron la diplomatura. Faltó Scott Karina y Cabrera Silvia. Adelante. Sí, en total fueron 78 los egresados. Muy bien. Bueno, continuando con la reunión, 
invitamos a la doctora Carla Muso, vicepresidenta de la Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes, que dará comienzo a la actividad científica de la noche. Bueno, buenas noches a todos. Eh, es un honor para mí esta noche contar con la presencia virtual del doctor Ronald Kahn, a quien agradecemos profundamente su participación en este acto de apertura de este año académico de la Sociedad Argentina de Diabetes. El doctor Ronald Kahn es médico graduado en la, de, en la Universidad de Louisville, realizado, realizó la especialización en medicina interna en la Universidad de Washington, hasta instalarse en el NIH, donde fue jefe de NIDDK. Fue director del Centro de Diabetes de Joslin, del que más tarde fue presidente. También profesor de medicina de Harvard, fue fundador de dos empresas de biotecnología y miembro de múltiples advisory board de la industria farmacéutica. El doctor Kahn fue uno de los primeros investigadores de la señalización de insulina, de los mecanismos de insulino resistencia de diabetes, obesidad y síndrome metabólico. Ganador de múltiples premios y fue nombrado como miembro honorario de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias y de la Academia Nacional de Medicina en Estados Unidos. Es autor de cientos de trabajos científicos publicados. Comenzamos así entonces la conferencia del doctor Kahn. Eh, les pido si tienen eh, que hacer preguntas, las pueden mandar por el chat o las podemos hacer al final, que el doctor va a estar eh, disponible para responder preguntas. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon. First, I want to thank Carla Musso for inviting me to the Argentine Diabetes Society to give this talk even though I can't be there in person, hopefully next time we will see each other live. But this year and is a very special year and it is so exciting to give talks around diabetes because we are celebrating two important anniversaries. One most of us are aware of, the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. But the second is that this is also the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the insulin receptor. And over the next 30 or 40 minutes, I'd like to review for you some of the important developments that have occurred in both of these areas, but also show you where I think some of the important future developments lie. The discovery of insulin, as most of you know, occurred in the summer of 1921. But these were two unlikely protagonists who were about to make this discovery. Fred Banting, a 29-year-old orthopedic surgeon who was having trouble establishing his practice in Ontario and asked his former professor of physiology if he could come and do some research over the summer of 1921 on an idea he had about the possibility of pancreatic extracts containing an active substance to control blood sugar and diabetes. He was assisted during that summer by a 22-year-old medical student, Charles Best, and given a laboratory and some dogs on which to operate. And it was during this time that Banting and Best, along with the support of others, demonstrated that an extract from beef or pork pancreas could indeed lower the blood sugar in a diabetic dog. This seminal work was published in 1922 and led ultimately to Banting and the professor whose laboratory he was working in, McLeod receiving the Nobel Prize, although many others participated in this discovery. What is truly amazing is how quickly this was applied to humans. The work on the dog was done in August of 1921. And by January of 1922, the first patient actually received insulin. His name was Leonard Thompson. He was a 14-year-old boy at the time who had had several years of type 1 diabetes controlled by a very strict diet, but was now in ketoacidosis with multiple skin abscesses and near death stored. 
although the first extract that was injected into him on January 11th did not produce any effects on blood glucose uh, and actually caused a sterile abscess. Subsequent tries just 10 days later using a more purified extract actually did lower his blood sugar and Leonard Thompson went on to survive for an, another 13 years to the age of 27 when he died of bacterial pneumonia because penicillin had not yet been discovered. This was of course the first landmark in the history of the use of insulin for diabetes therapy uh, but by 1923, insulin was already being commercially produced, all initially by extraction from beef and pork pancreas. And during these early years, attempts were made to improve this insulin by finding ways to both prolong its action and make it pure. Uh, Hagedorn in Copenhagen found that adding protamine to insulin prolonged its action, leading to PZI insulin and then NPH insulin. And by 1955, we actually finally learned the sequence of this important protein when Fred Sanger completed the sequence of bovine insulin, a work for which he also won the Nobel Prize. Insulin was also a leader in the history of genetically engineered medicines because human insulin became one of the first proteins expressed in bacteria by a biotech company called Genentech. And Eli Lilly picked up on this to make the first recombinant human insulin for therapy of human patients. There were also developments in semi-synthesis of human insulin in Novo Nordisk, and ultimately the first engineered insulin analogs, in this case, Lice Pro Insulin, designed to be more rapid acting. More recently, of course, we know that this development of insulin was augmented by glucose sensors, initially the glucose watch, and then later closed loop systems, such as the Medtronic and others, so that now we have really very sophisticated ways to deliver insulin. And we continue to have new developments in insulin, including orally active insulins uh, that are under consideration for possible improvement of compliance in those patients who are not willing to take injection. But when Banting and Best discovered insulin, they didn't even know what insulin was chemically, and they certainly didn't know how insulin worked. It was 1926 before John J. Abel, a pharmacologist at Johns Hopkins, postulated that insulin is likely a peptide based on the fact that you crystallize it and that it was sensitive to de degradation by proteases. Rachmel Levine and colleagues demonstrated that insulin could stimulate glucose uptake in the dog. And this was the first real insight into the mechanism of action suggesting possibly it worked on the membrane to train glucose transporter properties. But attempts to find an insulin receptor were largely unsuccessful, <clears throat> initially using unlabeled insulin, and then later uh, using uh, labeled uh, insulin uh, analogs. And so this really posed the question of how did, does insulin work at the level of the cell? These early attempts, however, were really very uh, poorly received. Even the famous researchers, Burson and Yallo, who discovered the radioamino assay for insulin, thought initially that there was no specificity, there was no correlation between insulin binding to the cell and its probable receptor. But this all changed in 1971, when two labs at the NIH, uh, the lab of Pedro Quatricasis and the lab of Jesse Roth with Pierre Frechet showed that insulin receptors were present on the membrane of the cell. And this is this very classic experiment in which on the left panel, we're looking at the ability of different insulins and insulin analogs to compete for binding of radioactively labeled insulin to liver membranes. You can see beef, pork, and human insulins are most potent, followed by fish insulin, then pro-insulin, then guinea pig insulin and some chemically modified insulins. 
And this exactly correlates with their biological activity and their ability to stimulate glucose uptake into fat cells. So this showed that the insulin receptor that was being studied was not a nonspecific protein, but really a truly uh, biologically linked receptor. And it was soon shown that these insulin receptors are present on all cells of the body, including tissues not previously considered to be insulin sensitive, such as lymphocytes and brain. They were conserved across species and that there was a similar and closely related hormone and receptor system for IGF-1, which could bind to the IGF-1 receptor, but could also weakly bind to the insulin receptor and vice versa, so that both ligands can cross-react with each other's receptor, creating what was called at the time specificity spillover, a phenomenon that allows high concentrations of insulin to have growth effects and high concentrations of IGF-1 to have metabolic effects. But how does this insulin receptor signal? This actually uh, important concept came not just from basic science, but came from a clinical observation that opened a basic science store. And that was the discovery that some patients with insulin resistance, severe insulin resistance, have antibodies, autoantibodies to the insulin receptor, a syndrome uh, that we initially called insulin resistance syndrome uh, type B. And here you see a classic experiment in which cells which have insulin receptors are either exposed to buffer, a normal control serum, or serum from one of these patients with anti-receptor antibodies and insulin resistance, and we're measuring insulin binding. And you can see that insulin binding is severely depressed by this autoantibody, the insulin receptor, which binds to the receptor and blocks radioactive insulin binding. But this antibody was also an important tool because at that time, we did not have any knowledge of the sequence of the receptor, any cloning of the receptor, any, ant any experimental antibodies. So these naturally occurring antibodies became a way to look at receptor structure and function. And using these anti-receptor antibodies, Masato Kasuga and Andres Carlson in my lab showed that if you took cells that contained insulin receptors and you radioactively labeled them with 32P to form radioactively labeled ATP, you could then extract the cells after insulin stimulation, precipitate these extracts with these patient-derived autoantibodies and look for what was going on at the level of the receptor in terms of phosphorylation. And here you see that there's a 95 uh, kilodalton band on this SDS gel, which increases following insulin stimulation. And this band ultimately became identified as the beta subunit of the insulin receptor, the subunit that signals through a tyrosine kinase activity. We now actually know, of course, the whole structure of the insulin receptor. It's a tetrameric protein composed of two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. The two alpha subunits are disulfide linked to each other and to the beta subunits and are entirely extracellular. And they form the major insulin binding subunit. The beta subunit, on the other hand, is a transmembrane protein. And inside the cell, this beta subunit has a number of important domains, including an ATP binding site, which is the site of this intracellular kinase activity, and multiple sites of tyrosine that undergo autophosphorylation. This complex uh, is present in the membrane of the cell and forms very complicated, but very beautiful three-dimensional structures. This is some of the latest kind of research where you can actually look at the structure of the extracellular domain of the insulin receptor by a technique called cryo-electron microscopy. And you can see the short part of the extracellular beta subunit, the many 
domains of the alpha subunit uh, on the outside of the cell. And bound to this insulin receptor are the, is the insulin molecule shown up here, which actually uh, binds at least a two, uh, le a two uh, copies per receptor. And some studies say as many as four copies or four molecules of insulin may bind to a single receptor to activate it. So this is the outside of the cell, but if you look at the whole uh, cell membrane, this extracellular domain of the receptor is connected to the intracellular domain where the kinase activity is. And when insulin binds to the unoccupied insulin receptor, it undergoes a conformational change such that the two transmembrane domains and the associated intracellular domain are brought together, allowing transphosphorylation of the receptor, activation of the receptor toward other substrates, and the classical pathway that we now call insulin signaling. It's dependent on ligand, that is insulin binding, it's dependent on the tyrosine kinase and downstream on metabolic pathways linked to other in intracellular enzymes. In fact, here's a more uh, complete picture of this insulin action showing the membrane of the cell with the insulin receptor and its alpha and beta subunits, the IGF-1 receptor and its alpha and beta subunits. And both of these receptors uh, bind their respective ligands causing autophosphorylation and activation of the receptor. And the major pathway of signaling is by phosphorylating intracellular substrates. The major substrate for the insulin receptor are a series of proteins called IRS proteins, insulin receptor substrates one, two, three, and four. And when insulin receptor phosphorylates these intracellular substrates, they serve as second messengers by interacting with other intracellular enzymes, like an enzyme called PI3 kinase or phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. This enzyme is composed of two different subunits, which bind to the IRS1 protein and, when stimulated, produce phosphatidyl inositol trisphosphate or PIP3 which then activates further downstream enzymes in the insulin signaling pathway, such as uh, AKT and the atypical protein kinase Cs. Ultimately, this pathway accounts for essentially all of the metabolic actions of insulin, because through this chain of phosphorylation events, insulin stimulates the translocation of glucose transporter containing vesicles to the plasma membrane to bring glucose into the cell. And it stimulates the phosphorylation of other proteins that are involved in stimulation of lipid synthesis, glycogen synthesis, protein synthesis, and also in liver, the inhibition of gluconeogenesis. So this is the primary metabolic pathway of insulin signaling. Insulin and IGF-1 also stimulate a second pathway through a second substrate called SHIC, which activates the RASMAP kinase pathway. And this pathway is more important for effects on both protein synthesis and cell growth and differentiation. So we have these two major insulin signaling pathways, one for its metabolic actions and one for its growth actions. Insulin predominantly stimulates the metabolic pathway and IGF-1 receptors, predominantly the growth pathway, but both can stimulate to some extent the other pathway as well, leading to this type of receptor signaling crosstalk. There are other pathways, which I also won't have time to talk about, but these might become important for many other of the effects of insulin besides just its metabolic and growth actions. Now, as I noted earlier, one of the findings when we discovered the insulin receptor was that it's present on all cells of the body, not just the classic target tissues 
like liver, muscle, and fat, but on all cells of the body. And figuring out what insulin does in every tissue of the body has been something that we've been interested in doing and have been really working on along with others over the last 10 to 15 or more years. We do this using a genetic technique uh, in mice to knock out the insulin receptor. It's called Crelox recombination. And I won't explain the details of the, the genetics except to say that when you do this Crelox recombination, it allows you to knock out, genetically inactivate the insulin receptor in one tissue at a time, depending on what tissue has the Cre enzyme. So if you put the Cre enzyme in muscle, uh, you can create what we call the miracle mouse or muscle insulin receptor. If you express it in liver, we get the lyrico or liver insulin receptor or the fat insulin receptor or the brown adipose tissue insulin receptor knockout, et cetera. And what this has shown us is that every tissue of the body in some way is insulin responsive. For example, in liver, in hepatocytes, insulin is critical for stimulation of lipogenesis and inhibition of gluconeogenesis. And if you knock out the insulin receptor in hepatocytes, you decrease lipogenesis and increase gluconeogenesis. In skeletal muscle, insulin is important for stimulation of glucose metabolism and cell growth. In fat cells, for adipose differentiation and fat storage. But in other tissues of the body, insulin also has action. For example, in the beta cell, insulin is involved in making the cell uh, sensitive to glucose sensing. In neurons, insulin is important roles on neurotransmission. And endothelial cells, important effects on blood flow. In cardiac myocytes, important effects on metabolism and growth. And in macrophages, important effects on the immune system. So insulin action is occurring in every tissue and every cell of the body. And when this process is altered, this may lead to a disruption of the normal function of each of these tissues. We call this disruption of insulin action or disruption of insulin effects, insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is basically any state in which a normal amount of insulin produces a less than normal biological response. And it could be one of the classic responses like lowering blood glucose, but it could also be effects on other responses that insulin is important for, like muscle growth or adipose uh, tissue development. Insulin resistance can be general. It can be in all tissues of the body, or it can be tissue specific. And of course, in patients receiving insulin, we usually talk about insulin resistance based on insulin dose. Anyone requiring more than a physiologic replacement of insulin is insulin resistant. But insulin resistance also occurs in patients not receiving insulin. Uh, and in this case, we usually measure insulin re resistance by noting that the patients have hyperinsulinemia. They have elevated insulin levels out of proportion to the glucose. But we can also measure insulin resistance by giving an IV insulin tolerance test or doing a euglycemic clamp or some other more sophisticated measure of whole body insulin resistance. Clinically, insulin resistance can present in many different forms. Obesity, pregnancy, patients with lipodystrophy, children with leprechaunism, Cushing syndrome, hypertension, polycystic ovarian disease. And when you look at these many faces of insulin resistance, you can think of it as a spectrum, a kind of pyramid. At the top of this pyramid are severe forms of insulin resistance, which are very rare insulin receptor genetic defects, the type A syndrome of insulin resistance, insulin receptor autoantibodies, the type B syndrome, lipoatrophic diabetes. These are all very rare forms of insulin resistance, but the patients who have these forms of insulin resistance have very severe insulin resistance indeed. 
endocrine disorders like Cushing's and acromegaly, <coughs> surgical stress create pretty severe insulin resistance and are more common, but not as common, for example, as type 2 diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And then, of course, at the base of this pyramid are the very common forms of insulin resistance, not as severe as some of the others, but nonetheless, very important insulin resistance because it produces some of the most common disorders uh, that were associated with meta metabolism in the human population. Obesity, essential hypertension, metabolic syndrome, dyslipidemias, polycystic ovarian disease, and physiologically uh, situations such as pregnancy and puberty. We frequently call this cluster of insulin resistance at the base of this pyramid, the metabolic syndrome or the insulin resistance syndrome. And classically, this was defined initially as containing not only uh, glucose intolerance or type two diabetes, but featuring central obesity, essential hypertension, dyslipidemias with accelerated atherosclerosis. But now we know that insulin resistance syndrome or metabolic syndrome also can often include non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD D or non-alcoholic <coughs> steatohepatitis, NASH, reproductive dysfunction, particularly polycystic ovarian disease. But these patients also have increased risks of a number of cancers. They have increased risks for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of neurodegeneration and ultimately impaired longevity. And these very common forms are what create the clinical challenge of insulin resistance that we see every day in many, many patients that are present to us clinically and present to internists and primary care physicians as well. Trying to understand what causes this form of insulin resistance or these forms of insulin resistance, therefore, is really important. And it's important to recognize that it's certainly multifactorial. We know that genes contribute to this problem, as well as environment. And other factors such as epigenetics, that kind of imprinting that occurs due to a maternal environment or uh, some other environmental stresses that leave a, a mark in your genes, epigenetics. And of course, now there's a lot of interest in the impact of the gut microbiome and how this interacts with diet and other environmental factors to create insulin resistance. A big driver, a big driver of this insulin resistance, which is occurring in metabolic syndrome, is in fact obesity and adipose tissue. Because if you think about what's happening in the body, let's imagine that this cell shown here in blue is a liver or muscle cell with the insulin receptor, the IRS proteins, PI3 kinase and AKT, producing normal insulin action. In the face of obesity or even mild overweight, there's an expansion of adipose tissue. And this adipose tissue also develops a level of local inflammation from macrophages and other forms of white blood cells. And this leads to the secretion or release of many factors from the adipose tissue mass. First are free fatty acids, which are released as part of lipolysis. And these free fatty acids can act on toll-like receptors or be taken up into target cells and converted to di diacylglycerols. And both of these activate intracellular kinases, junk, mTOR, IKK, novel PKCs that are able to serine phosphorylate the IRS proteins. This serine phosphorylation turns off the insulin signal. I've told you that tyrosine phosphorylation turns it on, but serine phosphorylation tends to turn it off. And there are other factors leading to serine phosphorylation. All of the cytokines like IL-6 and TNF are acting on their receptors to activate these same uh, stress kinases that serine phosphorylate IRS proteins. 
or act on receptors that produce a protein called uh, SOX proteins, which can act to inhibit also uh, tyrosine phosphorylated IRS-1. Inside the cell, branch chain amino acids and other metabolites are also creating mitochondrial dysfunction with reactive oxygen species and a process known as ER stress, which leads to further activation of a process called the unfolded protein response. And finally, most recently, uh, we and others have shown that fat cells can release little vesicles called exosomes that contain microRNAs that can attach to, these exosomes can attach to these target cells and release their microRNAs also down regulating uh, insulin signaling intracellularly. So all of this works to decrease this IRS1, PI3 kinase and AKT pathway and leads to decreases in insulin action or insulin resistance. But it's important to know that people who develop type two diabetes are at genetic risk for type two diabetes because they already have insulin resistance. This came from a study that we uh, did many years ago uh, where we showed that insulin resistance can precede and predict type two diabetes and offspring of type two diabetic parents. So the way this study was done is that we took 155 offspring of two type two diabetes parents, and we took them at the age of around 30 when they were normal glucose tolerance, but we measured insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity and another parameter called glucose effectiveness. That is how much glucose can get into the cell, even if no insulin's around. Insulin secretion, was totally normal in these offspring at this pre-diabetic stage. So it wasn't predictive at all of who would become diabetic. But if you looked at insulin sensitivity and glucose effectiveness, they were predictive of who would become diabetic. And if the offspring had low insulin sensitivity and low glucose effectiveness, over a 25 year follow-up, 80% of these offspring developed type two diabetes. On the other hand, if the, ins if the offspring had high insulin sensitivity and high glucose effectiveness, none of the offspring developed diabetes, even though they had two type two diabetic parents. And if they had intermediate values, say low insulin sensitivity and high glucose effectiveness, or low glucose effectiveness and high insulin sensitivity, they had intermediate values, but you can see the impact of low insulin sensitivity. Even in the presence of high glucose effectiveness, where almost half the offspring developed type two diabetes. So insulin resistance precedes and predicts who of the offspring of type two diabetic parents will become insulin, will become type two diabetic. So what causes this insulin resistance? This is occurring before obesity is present, before these circulating factors that I just showed you in the last slide can act on cells to produce insulin resistance. There must be something intrinsic to these cells of these individuals that lead to insulin resistance. So what are the intrinsic or cell autonomous defects that can be found in human type two diabetes and in metabolic syndrome? To answer this question, I want to introduce you to a new technology, a technology that I think it will change the face of diabetes and metabolic disease in many different ways. And this is the technology to produce iPS cells. iPS stands for induced pluripotent stem cells. And iPS cells can be produced from any cell of the body, skeletal muscle, skin, uh, fat cells, blood cells, all of these cells, if they are exposed to uh, an agent carrying certain important genes, these are genes that are called pluripotency genes, they make the cell go back to a more embryonic state. And you can get them into the cell using retroviruses, lentiviruses, adenoviruses, sendiviruses, et cetera. 
you can produce what are known as human-induced pluripotent stem cells. The advantage of these cells is that they will can be cultivated in culture forever, but you can also, using chemical and hormonal cocktails, convert these cells into any cell of interest for the study or treatment of diabetes, pancreatic beta cells, skeletal muscle cells, fat cells, liver cells, et cetera. Indeed, recently, uh, there have been some work to make uh, human stem cell derived pancreatic beta cells a part of diabetes therapy, at least in one patient with type one diabetes. For type two diabetes, what we decided to do, however, was to take skeletal muscle biopsies or peripheral blood cells, convert them using sendivirus to iPS cells, and then make them into skeletal myotypes or myoblasts so that we could study what was the cause of this insulin resistance that is central or present in type 2 diabetes, even in the absence of any circulating factors in the body. So this is what we did. And we did it across the whole spectrum of insulin resistance. We have patients with insulin receptor mutations and appropriate controls, patients with type 2 diabetes and their controls. And then at the mildest end of the insulin resistance pyramid, we even have normal individuals, that is non-diabetic individuals, who have either high levels of insulin sensitivity or relatively high levels of insulin resistance, but are within the normal range. And so for each of these categories, we can make IPS cells, we can make IPS-derived biotubes, and then we can take these cells and study how is insulin signaling modified, if at all, glucose metabolism or mitochondrial metabolism, messenger RNA and protein expression, and we can do even more sophisticated signaling by looking at the whole phosphorylation cascade through a technique known as phosphoproteomics. So let's briefly look at how this uh, might work in a case of type 2 diabetes. And here's a study we recently published where we took eight controls and eight type 2 diabetic patients, half were males and half were females. And we did biopsies and made IPS cells from these patients. The average age of the patients was between 60 and 65. Of course, compared to the controls, the type 2 diabetes patients had higher BMIs, higher blood glucoses, and higher hemoglobin A1Cs, although they had relatively well-controlled type 2 diabetes in all cases. And we then were able to take the cells from them, make human IPS cells, and differentiate these cells in vitro into myoblasts, which we call iMyos, or IPS cell-derived myoblasts. These cells, uh, we found, have similar gene and protein expression as normal blasts, normal myoblasts that is taken directly from the patient, and that there is no effect of type 2 diabetes on this reprogramming to iMyos. So these cells become now a tissue culture model of the muscle of a type 2 diabetic patient, but a tissue culture model uh, where we have diabetes in a dish. So uh, what happens in these cells? What do we find in these cells as far as insulin resistance and insulin signaling? Here again is that classic insulin signaling cascade, the insulin receptor, the IRS proteins, PI3 kinase AKT, and downstream effects such as glucose uh, transport. Well, if we look by Western blotting at signaling in this cascade, what we find is that in this important PI3 kinase AKT cascade that's critical for the metabolic actions of insulin, you can see that in control cells, this phosphorylation is increased. It's also increased in the cells of the type 2 diabetic patient. But compared to the control, this reaction is reduced by about 30%, even in the absence of any serum factors. Likewise, if we go further downstream to GSK3 or FOXO1, 
These two are stimulated both in the control and the type two diabetic cells. But in each case, the type two diabetic cells is significantly less responsive than the cells from the control individuals. And finally, if we look at glucose uptake, again, we can see insulin stimulating glucose uptake in the control cells, producing a small, but actually not statistically significant effect in the type two diabetes cells. And this is the same is true for glucose metabolism, mitochondrial glucose metabolism. So these cells, IPS derived myoblasts from patients with type two diabetes show insulin resistance in a tissue culture dish. Now we've already shown that there are several sites of insulin resistance, but what's become clear through these recent studies is that the insulin resistance is really a much more global uh, signaling alteration. It's not just the insulin signaling pathway or the classic insulin signaling pathway that's disrupted, but it's many signaling pathways. We figured this out by using a technique called phosphoproteomics. To do this, we take the IMIOs, we stimulate them with insulin in vitro, and then we extract the proteins digest the proteins into little peptides, and then analyze these peptides using HPLC and a technique called LC-MSMS. With this, we can identify between 15,000 and 35,000 different phosphorylation sites occurring in any individual cell. And when we look at these sites uh, and we quantitate the amount of phosphorylation, we can see some important changes. So this is an example of what's called a heat map, where we've shown changes in phosphorylation by color coding. So each row going across the graph represents one single phosphorylation site in one protein. Blue indicates a low level of phosphorylation. Red indicates a high level of phosphorylation. And you can see at the top of this graph where we're comparing control in type 2 diabetic males to control in type 2 diabetic females, uh, both basal and stimulated, that at the top of this graph, uh, here are sites that are insulin stimulated in all individuals. Here are sites that are insulin suppressed in all individuals. And, but uh, these are somehow quantitatively different in the controls than in the type two diabetic patients. And I can show you that if we look at these individually. For example, here's a serine phosphorylation on IRS-1, actually two serine phosphorylations. And in general, serine phosphorylations tend to turn off insulin signaling, although not all of them do equally. So these are two different sites, serine 270 and serine 348. You can see that both of these sites are stimulated. The first site is stimulated in its phosphorylation by insulin. But in the cells of the type 2 diabetic patient, both the basal phosphorylation and the stimulated phosphorylation are higher than in the control cells. Whereas for this site on IRS1, which is slightly inhibited by insulin, this is also exaggerated in the cells from the type 2 diabetic patient, where the phosphorylation is decreased. And if we go further down this insulin signaling cascade through AKT to another important critical node of insulin signaling called the mTOR node, proteins in this area may show also quantitative changes in phosphorylation. This protein called TSC2, which is insulin stimulated in its phosphorylation, has reduced phosphorylation in the type 2 diabetic, while the protein called mTOR actually has also insulin stimulation that's increased in the type 2 diabetic patient. And this is just the beginning of the changes. These are the changes which are occurring in this insulin-stimulated cluster. But if you look at this heat map, not only are these insulin-stimulated changes occurring, but there are many changes which are not necessarily insulin regulated, but are also changed by type 2 diabetes. Here are a whole series of phosphorylation sites 
that are significantly upregulated by type 2 diabetes in males and females, even though they're not insulin stimulated. And here's a series of all over 360 sites which are downregulated by type 2 diabetes, even though they're not significantly regulated by insulin. So these are changes in the basal phosphoproteome, and they occur in many, many different proteins. 271 proteins with 371 sites are up, and 361 sites on 219, 90 proteins are down. And I'll just show you again a couple of examples. Here you see a site in a protein called RPS6KB2, and this site is not insulin stimulated. There's basal stimulation in the control and basal stimulated in the type 2 diabetic, but it is increased in type 2 diabetes, as is this site in a protein called SETD1. On the other hand, these two proteins, SRSF5 and MEF2C, both have sites which are decreased by diabetes, even though they're not insulin regulated sites. And these uh, upregulated phosphorylation upregulated sites and phosphorylation downregulated sites occur in many pathways involved in signal transduction, RNA metabolism, regulation of DNA and chromatin, as well as mRNA splicing, fascicular transport, and transcription. So if we put all of these together, we can see that there are multiple defects in this state of insulin resistance in the type 2 diabetic individual that can be defined by phosphoproteomics and that lead to changes in insulin responsiveness and mitochondrial metabolism, and also changes in mRNA and protein expression that I won't have time uh, to talk about uh, this evening. But finally, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that in the normal population, at least 20% of normal individuals are already insulin resistant and are predisposed to type 2 diabetes and metabolic disease. And we want to know what do they have and do they have anything in common with these people with type 2 diabetes? So we got another cohort of individuals and their cells, 10 insulin sensitive, 10 insulin resistant individuals uh, without diabetes, but uh, across this normal spectrum of insulin resistance. And we also performed uh, these studies, including phosphoproteomics. And when we do that, we find that the non-diabetic insulin resistant individuals and the type two diabetic insulin resistant individuals have a lot of things in common. Almost 200 of these changes in basal phosphorylation are seen in both populations, and almost 400 changes in the insulin-stimulated phosphorylations are common to the type 2 diabetic individuals and the non-diabetic insulin-resistant individuals. And we think of these as being the really key nodes of altered signaling in cellular insulin resistance that's in the normal population that predisposes to metabolic syndrome and predisposes to type 2 diabetes. And I won't go through uh, all of these up and down regulated sites, except to show you one example here of a protein called SLC38, which is decreased in its phosphorylation in insulin-resistant males and insulin-resistant females who don't have diabetes, and is also suppressed in type 2 diabetes compared to controls, males and females. So this is a site of common down regulation. Where are these sites? Well, again, they're, they're all throughout the cell, but a few of them really stand out as being close to the central core of the insulin signaling system. So for example, serine 1101 and IRS1, a regulatory site of serine phosphorylation, is increased both in type 2 diabetic individuals, and non-diabetic insulin-resistant individuals. Serine 2481 in mTOR, another protein involved in insulin resistance, is also upregulated in its phosphorylation in both of these uh, disease states. And finally, 
there's an upregulation of a serine phosphorylation 124 on AKT associated with insulin resistance, as well as downregulation of a serine on TBC1D1, a protein involved in GLUT4 vesicle translocation. And again, <clears throat> this is in common to both the type 2 diabetic and the insulin resistant non diabetic individuals. Of course, this is only a few of the changes. As you could see from those uh, heat maps, there are many, many other changes also contributing to insulin resistance. So just to summarize this last part, uh, IMIOs from type 2 diabetes patients and insulin-resistant non-diabetics mirror key features of insulin resistance in vitro that are seen in vivo, including signaling defects, impaired glucose uptake and mitochondrial oxidation, that by phosphoproteomics, IMIOs from patients show a complex series of changes in protein phosphorylation, both at proteins close to the insulin receptor and proteins more, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> more, more distant from the insulin receptor. And although I didn't get a chance to show it, we also find that the sex of the patient can have some impact on these signaling differences. <clears throat> so if we go back to our progressive pathogenesis of type two diabetes, we now believe that through genetic and epigenetic changes, individuals who are prone to develop type two diabetes, who have developed type two diabetes, start with these cell intrinsic alterations in cell signaling. And that what occurs through a series of environmental effects, including diet, exercise, and the gut microbiome, is that patients develop obesity, ER stress, inflammation, changes in free fatty acids and cytokines, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. They also eventually get all of these changes in the beta cells, and all of this leads to hyperglycemia. But what we hope is that using the IPS cell disease in a dish models, we may uncover new fundamental defects in type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And hopefully these will be new targets for therapy in the future. So I would like to close here and simply acknowledge the fact that the work I showed is the work of many talented and hardworking fellows in my laboratory. I particularly want to highlight the IPS cell work which was done by Giacomo Batista, Nita Haydar, Jasmine Labachi, and uh, other work done by some of the other fellows uh, in the laboratory. I thank you uh, very much for your attention and uh, would be happy to take any questions if that's going to be possible uh, in this particular format. So thank you uh, again, and I'm going to stop sharing and end. Uh, the video. Dr. Khan, good night. Uh, we'd like to, first of all, to thank you for the great talk, uh, for sharing with us this first meeting of the year uh, at our Diabetes Society. Um, we all expect to see you as soon as the COVID uh, pandemic is over. Uh, and I remember you, your trip in 2012 that you came to our meeting. Are you there? I am here, thank you very much. Okay. So, well, clearly insulin resistance and type two diabetes development as a multiple molecular defects. And it is good to know that we, that the discovery of this defect will help to, to find a better approach uh, of a uh, new therapeutic for the type two diabetes and insulin resistance. So I don't know if we have questions uh, at the audience, from the audience. Yes, okay. Professor Ken, 
Thank you very much for this, um, I would say, um, comprehensive talk. And I have uh, several questions, but I would be happy if you can answer me um, two at, at the least. <laughs> Um, the first question is about the, um, this uh, slide that you showed us when the muscle and liver cells in an inflammatory environment um, leads to uh, insulin resistance. But there are some papers, uh, or few papers, I, I, at least I know, that um, a little bit of inflammation is good for insulin sen sensitivity. Can you tell us about, about it? Well, I think that there are many factors that are up and down regulating insulin action all of the time. Uh, and as you point out, some of them at a sort of a certain level may have a beneficial effect, and some of them may, uh, in, in some cases, that beneficial effect may be lost at, at a different level. Even let's take insulin itself. Insulin itself, of course, uh, activates the receptor and it creates the signals we want to control blood sugar. But chronic hyperinsulinemia downregulates the insulin receptor and actually leads to insulin resistance. In case of inflammatory signals, in general, most inflammatory signals tend to create uh, a pattern of insulin resistance, but you are correct that in some cell types, some of these signals can have I would say some, but not all of the insulin action effects. They might, for example, uh, an infl inflammatory cell that's activated might have high glucose uptake, but it's really through a somewhat different mechanism or uh, inflammation may, may affect some other processes. So uh, these kinds of signals are really in a constant state of balancing and rebalancing. In general, inflammation creates insulin resistance, but there may be some limited number of circumstances where at least a, a few insulin actions can, or apparent insulin actions can be activated, but I don't think that's usually the case. Can I do another one? One more. Okay. <laughs> and the other one is related to this uh, knockout mouse that uh, mice that you uh, also you, you show us, uh, for example, uh, you, you knock out one, one uh, insulin receptor at a time, but you show us that the uh, IGF-1 and insulin can, uh, can make a crosstalk uh, yes. uh, between them. So I, I, I'm wondering if, if uh, you should uh, uh, do a, a double knockout mouse, uh, uh, I, I mean, I, a, a insulin receptor, an IGF-1 receptor to to look for a, a, a complete action of, of insulin. Right, this is a very good point uh, that you make. And we actually have done this. Um, under normal physiologic circumstance, uh, insulin and IGF-1 are predominantly acting through their own receptors, one to create a metabolic action and one a growth action. But you're right, in the absence of insulin receptor, for example, uh, IGF-1, may have some insulin-like effects or vice versa. So uh, we have done double knockouts of insulin and IGF receptors in a number of tissues. Uh, and you see a, usually a much stronger phenotype. For example, in muscle, if you knock out only the insulin receptor, there's mild whole body or systemic insulin resistance. But if you knock out the insulin and IGF-1 receptor both, then blood glucose levels go up more. And there's also a loss of normal muscle growth because you have this uh, combined defect. If, if, so you're right. Uh, if you make the double knockout, you can see things that we don't normally see if you only do the single knockout. But part of this is due, of course, to the crosstalk. And part of this is due to some of the effects that would have been mediated, let's say by the IGF receptor versus the insulin receptor. So it creates this more severe phenotype. Okay, Dr. Khan, we have another question. Uh, interleukin E6 is an, is an adipocytokine that produces insulin resistance. 
but uh, interleukin-6 also behaves as an anti-inflammatory myokine. Do yes. you think is this explanation for these two different actions of interleukin-6? Yeah, so the, the actions of uh, various cytokines, and interleukin-6 being one example, uh, can be different in terms of insulin resistance at the level of a target cell like a liver cell than they might be in terms of creating an inflammatory response. So some uh, inflammatory cytokines uh, create an inflammatory response and add to insulin resistance. But some of the anti-inflammatory cytokines may not create as much insulin resistance because they don't create inflammation, but mm -hmm. still can at a given certain cell type produce some cellular insulin resistance in that cell type. Each of these really has, uh, I would say, a, there are a series of different effects. Uh, and sometimes the insulin resistance uh, is very mild, but often with cytokines, the insulin resistance can be uh, more severe. But IL-6, you're correct, uh, can have also anti-inflammatory actions. Okay, so the concept that insulin resistance is a distal phenomenon in insulin signaling is wrong, and there are defects throughout almost the entire cascade? Yes, I think this is another important point, Carla, that I, I'm glad you, you brought up. You know, I, I've recently uh, given a very, some a similar lectures at, uh, in other meetings and other institutions, and I think that this is a point which I maybe should emphasize more. When we say insulin resistance, we are really looking at a very broad alteration of cellular signaling. Altered insulin signaling in this context of type 2 diabetes is not just the receptor and the IRS proteins and PI3 kinase and even glucose transport. When you look at the whole cell, there are many other alterations which are not part of the classic insulin signaling cascade. So I think we have to almost maybe at some time rename insulin resistance into, but I haven't got the right name for it yet, but to really think of it as an altered cell signaling state of which insulin resistance is a clinically measurable part, but the other parts can be also identified experimentally measured as in other pathways besides classical insulin signaling pathways. Right. Uh, have you detected defects in the fusion of GLUT4 to the myocyte membrane? Uh, we have not directly measured uh, GLUT4 vesicle translocation to the membrane and its fusion with the membrane. We've only in these cells measured glucose uptake, which of course is a result of that fusion process, but we're not looking directly at the fusion. It is possible, uh, I would say, that at different steps in this translocation, there could be different components of insulin resistance, some in the translocation itself and some in the fusion with the membrane. So I do think at some point in the future, we really need to get uh, to even more detail in trying to separate out what steps in glucose uptake into the cell are the major steps of insulin resistance. We don't really know for sure because as I said, several of the proteins involved in this process show altered phosphorylation. So there could be actually altered Rations at more than one step, uh, and which one is dominant, we don't know. Okay. Uh, can exercise reverse phosphoproteomic defects? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't tested that. that. That actually is something we should look at. Uh, most of the phosphoproteomics that I showed in today's talk were, of course, done in cells in a tissue culture dish. And so if we wanted to look at exercise, we would probably have to look at uh, muscle and muscle biopsies uh, taken after insulin and after exercise. Uh, this obviously could be done, uh, but we haven't done that. 
Okay. Uh, so since we know the result of trial with uh, SLC2 inhibitors, it, it was noted the tendency to believe that metformin is not a crucial as a first drug as it was. So uh, what do you think about avoid metformin in the algorithm of uh, type 2 diabetes therapy? Yeah, well, this, yeah this is actually, uh, I think, an area where we don't really have a definitive answer yet. Let me start off by saying that uh, we really don't have a drug which directly treats insulin resistance. The closest drug we ever had, of course, were the thiazolidine diones, which really acted on the fat cell to change some of these uh, secretory and inflammatory pathways to try to reduce uh, the induced insulin resistance, the secondary insulin resistance. Metformin improves glucose uh, metabolism in the whole person or the whole animal, but it does this not by acting directly to improve insulin sensitivity, but you know probably by acting at other steps in the cell. We you know several, many different steps have been implicated: mitochondrial metabolism, AMP kinase, and so forth. SGLT2 inhibitors obviously work yet at a, a completely different step in terms of glucose control. They act mainly on the sodium glucose co-transporters in the kidney to promote glycosuria. And many of the effects on glucose metabolism are of course secondary to this increased uh, urine glucose loss. But we know that SGLT2 inhibitors also have effects, for example, on heart failure, which can't be explained by their effects to lower glucose. Uh, or even their diuretic effects and how those work, we don't know. And I would say that when we have looked uh, and we and others have looked, we don't see direct effects necessarily to improve insulin sensitivity above and beyond what would come with the weight loss. So I don't think that the SGLT2 inhibitors have a, also an insulin sensitizing effect, even though they can have some effects by lowering glucose lowering chronic hyperinsulinemia and producing a little bit of weight loss. Um, so that's sort of mechanistically how they work. In terms of choosing which to go first, um, you know, I think most of the major diabetes organizations still recommend starting with metformin. And I think that a lot of this is driven by the fact that we know over long periods of time, metformin is largely very safe. It's kind of effective as a first drug in many people, uh, and it's very inexpensive. But of course, it's not producing a permanent or totally effective treatment in a lot of patients uh, that will respond to other drugs, including SGLT2 inhibitors. So I think uh, we're sort of in this transition phase of deciding what to do clinically. I think if SGLT2 inhibitors were as inexpensive as metformin, or nearly as inexpensive as metformin, uh, then the balance of this argument might change a lot. But I think the current price differential also weighs into this fact because we're treating so many patients, and many of these patients are, uh, you know, uh, not able to necessarily afford these more expensive medications. Mm -hmm. And what do you think to add uh, these, uh, these ideas? Thiazolidine diones to, to metformin? To yeah, well, the, yeah, well the, the, I think thiazolidine diones, and even though they, they've lost favor you know, uh, tremendously uh, because of their uh, early reports about the cardiovascular risk, I actually think that thiazine, thiazolidine diones uh, are, can be for some patients still good drugs. They definitely uh, improve insulin sensitivity, even though they don't necessarily cause weight loss. Um, but I think that um, most people don't use them clinically, and I don't use them clinically much anymore. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The last question is, what do you think about the development of smart insulins 
that change their structure in the interaction with the receptor. Yeah. So those, those specific points of resistance that you have described can limit their efficacy. Yes. So smart insulins usually, there, there, there could be two kinds of smart insulins, actually. Uh, so in this question, uh, who the questioner is really actually referring in some ways to both kinds of smart insulins. One kind of smart insulin, which is what um, I would say most people think of as a smart insulin and it's under development, would be a glucose sensitive insulin. An insulin that would be released more, let's say from a binding protein to bind to receptors on the cell as glucose levels went up and then when glucose levels went down, would bind to some binding protein that would keep it in the circulation, not able to bind to the receptor. There are a couple of, at least a couple of companies working on these types of smart insulins with a little bit of success, but none of them are yet into the point of any kind of human clinical trials. And even the animal work is still pretty early uh, with those types of smart insulins. The second type of smart insulin, which also uh, has been thought about lo for longer, is a kind of smart insulin that might act on receptors in different tissues uh, preferentially. For example, you might think of if you're giving uh, insulin to a patient who's receiving insulin because they're receiving total parenteral nutrition, uh, for post-surgical treatment, that the really goal of that insulin is a little bit to keep the blood sugar down, but it's mainly to help that promote healing and the anabolic effects of insulin. And so an insulin in this case that worked more to promote glucose uptake and insulin action in muscle is more important than an insulin that would turn off hepatic glucose output, which is really not contributing so much to the hyperglycemia. On the other hand, if you have a patient that's prone to hypoglycemia, you might uh, also find it's important to find a better balance between insulin actions on liver and insulin action on muscle. So those would be a different kind of smart insulin. Those would be kind of a, an insulin that's somewhat tissue specific. Um, Right now, uh, there are some insulins, actually an insulin analogs that show some tissue preferential specificity. Even pro-insulin, the precursor of insulin, can show some specificity toward the liver over the muscle. Uh, but so far, nobody has got, gotten any of these uh, tissue preferential insulins into yet clinical practice uh, or into even clinical trials. So. Well, I guess pro-insulin was in clinical trials, but most others not. So I think that um, I'm not sure how many, if any, pharmaceutical companies are still working on those, but they're definitely working on the, the glucose-sensitive insulins as kind of a smart insulin. Okay, Dr. Khan, we don't have any more questions. So we'd like to thank you. Thank you for your time, for your good predisposition, and for your excellent talk. Um, so we'd like to, to really thank you to share this night with us. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you live, live and in person and hopefully in Argentina. Okay, great. Or the, uh, at the ADA. Or at the ADA, but that for me is more normal. <laughs> okay, bye-bye okay. now. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Para finalizar, queremos agradecer a todos los socios y no socios que se conectaron a esta reunión, también a los presidentes de otras sociedades científicas latinoamericanas y a los presentes los invitamos a un cóctel de camaradería. Muchas gracias y buenas noches.